So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, the hardships, the persecutions and the troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Um, On the 17th of August, 2013, five million people bought a copy of the Daily Mail. And some of them would have opened it up and seen this double-page spread about how an ex-army officer could squander three-quarters of a million pounds, lose his home and his family and his job. That ex-army major was me. And I want to share that story with how someone who kind of had everything that the world thinks is, is, is good could throw it all away in the space of just three years. And then I want to, and how Christ can come in and set those captives free. And how I'm trying to take that message on uh, and to share um, with people how much God loves us. Not because of what we do or what we don't do, just because he loves us. Um, I'm going to show you um, a picture in a minute. Some of these come with a bit of a health warning, so I'll move very quickly through them. You'll see the ones I mean in a second. Um, But first of all, I want to tell you what life was like before I placed my first bet. Um, I, as you probably realize, for those of you who know my mum, come from a Christian home. I have five brothers and sisters, um, and I came to a decision on my own that I wanted to follow Christ. Um, Quite an early age, um, I probably, before I became a Christian, the naughtiest boy in the school. Um, But overnight, things changed when I realized um, how much God loved me. And it was because I saw a picture. You know that lovely um, William Holman Hunt picture of Christ, the light of the world, where he's knocking on the door and there's only a handle on the inside. And that really meant a lot to me in Sunday school. And I carried on living my my life in the light. And what I mean by that is I would wake up in the morning and open up the Bible And I'd be enthusiastic about hearing what God had to say. Even age 11, and I used to swim um, for Tumridge Wells Monson. Uh, I used to do morning training. I'd wake up uh, before 6 o'clock and I'd be be reading my Bible. Um, And I used to pray. I used to talk to God. And those things, those two things, listening to God and talking to him, developed my relationship. And I really was living in the light. And all the time I lived in the light... God seemed to bless what I did. My, the things I did, the endeavors that I did, seemed to work out. All I wanted to do was, was fly. That's all I ever wanted to do. I went off to the army, um, and for nine months, um, before I could learn to fly, um, the army were going to take me on this thing called, which is recognized as one of the, the greatest leadership courses in, in the military world. Um, but it's tough, Sandhurst. And what everyone tells you is, the people in the know, they say, don't stand out. Just be a grey man. Don't do anything badly, but don't do anything well, whatever you do. On the first day I arrived at Sandhurst, my mother gave me something special. Um, It's called Living Light, and some of you might have seen that. Um, It's a version of Daily Light, but it comes from the Living Bible Translation, which I love. Uh, And I still look at that now. In the front of it, she wrote something. She said, sometimes in the future... You'd only have time for a few verses, so we thought that this might help. Armies may march on their stomachs, but spiritual food gets you even further. As an officer, you'll be responsible for the lives of your men. But as a Christian, you'll be responsible for their souls as well. And this was special to me. And sometimes I didn't have time uh, to sit and read uh, the Bible from chapter after chapter. And this is all I had, but it kept me going. After a couple of days at Santos, there was a bit of a commotion in the corridor. And I went to see what, what all the fuss was about. And there was a note that someone had pinned to the board um, to say, Army rugby trials this weekend. If you get selected for the Academy First 15, you get Wednesdays off training. So all 411 people in my intake <laughs> turned up to the rugby trial. And unfortunately, because there were so many of us, um, we had to have another rugby trial the next day for those who'd got through to the final day of selection. But that was a Sunday. The next morning, I turned up and I stood to attention in front of a big, tall lieutenant colonel. He had bushy sideburns, and do you know what? He even had a monocle. And I looked up and I said, sir, I can't play rugby today. I'm a Christian. I want to go to chapel. 
And I did. I went to chapel, and, and I didn't get selected to play uh, in the first 15 that Wednesday, but I was a reserve. And the person in my position got injured after a few minutes. I went on and played the best, best game of rugby I've ever played. Within just a week, they'd asked me to be the captain of the academy first 15, which was a great honor because the commandant, the general, loved his rugby, and he used to come along and talk to me on a Wednesday and say, you know, who's been selected and who are we playing? And I think at my time at the end, my, my time at Sandhurst, um, when it came for him to decide who was going to be the officer cadet that graduated top of their intake, I must have been the only one he knew by name because he selected me. <laughs> And I was awarded the Queen's Sword of Honor, which was a great honor. And I had to, to lead the Sovereign's Parade on the final day of our pass out. And my mum was there to see that. Uh, and my career in the army was pretty much mapped out. Now, it didn't all go according to plan. Um, you mentioned that all I wanted to do was fly. Well, I went off to flying training and discovered I could fly fine. It was relatively important. And so uh, after a, a one near miss, and it was a very near miss, um, the instructor normally at the end of your sortie sits down with you and talks about what you've done well, what you could do better. This time he was white as a sheet and he just legged it. <laughs> and I was called into the officer commanding and I, I stood there and he said to me, Justin, before you kill yourself or someone else, you need to find another regiment to go to. Now I was dealing with a few anger issues because as I've mentioned, all I wanted to do was fly. Someone told me that if you join the Royal Artillery, you can shoot aeroplanes down. So I joined them and I felt much better. <laughs> And my time in the army was, was a wonderful time. I, I'm, quite, I'm quite a competitive chap, and I, I, I like the thrill of the things that the army gave me. I, I trained in military parachuting. I did the all-arms commando course. Um, I went to Northern Ireland and to Bosnia in peacekeeping roles, which were quite exciting times. And I saw some pretty awful things, really, the results of, of ethnic cleansing when village against village turn on each other and family against family. Of course, in those days, there was no opportunity to talk about combat stress. And uh, actually, if you talked about things like that, it was a weakness. So you just bottled it all in, kept a stiff upper lip, and, and carried on. For two months, I was the youngest major in the British Army, and things were looking really good. But you know what? I was restless. I was never comfortable with the here and now. I was always thinking, what's next? What's, what's next? Where do I go? Where do I need to do to, to do this and to get promoted? And... One day someone told me I wouldn't make colonel for six years, so I left. I went to work in the city. But I went from being someone who'd led 460 men on a high-pressure operational tour to being a junior T-boy. Uh, and that's what I was. I knew nothing about the world of business. I knew nothing about insurance. But I was ambitious. And people used to leave the office at five and go home, and, and I'd stay, and I'd get my books out, and I'd study, sometimes till nine o'clock at night. And at nine o'clock at night, the only people left in the office are the cleaning company and the managing director. He used to come sit next to me and ask me what I was doing. And I'd say to him, I'm ambitious. I want to catch up with everyone else. Within two years, I'd been promoted, and I was one of the youngest managing directors within a, a global financial services company working in the city of London. I had a six-figure salary. I'd married the girl of my dreams. Things were all looking rosy. But, let me just show you a photograph. I won't show it to you for long, don't worry. Um, that's me. And I've got a horrible, smug look on my face. And behind me, nestling over there, it was taken on the Isle of Capri, and behind me is the Bay of Naples. You might just be able to see that. That's Mount Vesuvius. You know the volcano that erupted in AD 79, destroying Pompeii? In my head, I had a volcano. A volcano that was about to erupt catastrophically and destroy everything I'd worked so hard to achieve. Because you see, I'd pushed God away. I stopped reading my Bible. Stopped looking at living light. I said to God, you know what, God, thank you so much. You, you've given me everything I ever wanted and things are fine now. I can take it from here. And I made this excuse to him well, you know, I live in Derbyshire. I, we moved up there to be near my, my wife's family. They had a hotel up there. And I used to commute down to London, three hours on the train and three hours back, five days a week. And I said to myself, that's what people do in life, isn't it? Because the important thing is to make money, is to look good. And, and, and I said, God, there's no churches up in, in the little village I live in, so there's no point in us really doing that. And, and actually, you know what? I can't have a quiet time because I have to leave for work so early. 
I never stopped believing in him, but I pushed him away. I want to just show you what life was like. The things that we had as a family up to the point when I stopped living in the light. I'm going to go through this next slide really quickly. Okay, we had nice holidays. That's my lovely wife, Emma. Um, she was the girl of my dreams. Do you know what? I never, ever lied to her. I would tell her everything. She was absolutely my soulmate. We had nice cars, nice things. And, uh, and that's Matthew, um, furthest away from me there. Matthew, aged 11 months, we noticed, wasn't using his right hand at all. And I thought, Emma, that's a bit strange. Don't you think Matthew doesn't use his right hand? He grabs everything with his left hand. Don't you think it's odd? She said, oh, no, we just got left-handed people in our family. He'll be left-handed. But I noticed he wasn't really crawling like the other children his age, and some of them were even walking. One morning, I was driving to the station, and I turned the radio on, and I heard an interview with a retired footballer, and he said, I noticed my daughter, aged 11 months, wasn't using her right hand. So we took her to see someone. She had a diagnosis for something called right side hemiplegia. It's a form of cerebral palsy. She'd had a stroke when she was born, and she had limited movement in her right hand. I thought about that all day. When I got home, I said to Emma, look, do you know, why don't we just take Matthew to see a consultant and, and just to rule things out? So we did. Took him down to London. Within a few minutes, the consultant said, I believe your son has right side hemiplegia. He has stiffness in his right leg and his right arm and limited dexterity in his hand. We had a scan, and I can remember walking into the consultant's office to see a picture of my son's brain with a huge, great scar on it. He'd had a bleed into his brain round about the time he was born, and that caused scarring, and it was a scarring that had caused the right side hemiplegia. As we got up to leave, the consultant said, by the way, your son may well be susceptible to fits and go on and develop epilepsy at some stage in his life. One week later, I was at home. It was a hot day. Uh, Matthew had a streaming cold, and I was cuddling him, and his right arm started to jerk. I knew immediately what was happening. I just didn't know what to do. I did everything wrong. I, I put my arms around him and tried to reassure him. Uh, but it was a febrile fit caused by a very sharp peak in his temperature. Should have laid him out and loosened off his clothing and let him cool down. When he didn't come out of the fit, we put him in the car. I thought I could make it to the, to the hospital, but there was too much traffic. So we went back, called the ambulance. Matthew was laid out on the back seat, and by now he'd turned blue. And his lips were a dark shade of purple. In the army, they taught me, if you want to, to see if someone's breathing, you put your cheek up against their mouth. So you can feel their breath. I could feel nothing. I began to give him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. And for the first time in ages, I prayed. I said, God, please, I don't want to lose my son. Help. And pretty much straight away, around the corner came my next-door neighbor, who was a retired surgeon. He stepped in and took over. Uh, Matthew went away in the ambulance, and he was okay. But you know what? I wasn't. I went into denial. I, I kind of had these dreams that my son would be able to, to land an airplane. He'd be able to play rugby better than I could. All those selfish things you want for your children as a dad. Emma was brilliant. She went online and Googled it. She got her head around it. She kind of understood what it meant. I, I didn't. The following Saturday, I was at home and I did something I've done a million times before. I was watching sport. But this time, for the first time, I saw one of those adverts. 18% of every advert on television now is a gambling advert. And for the first time, I saw it. I got my laptop, deposited the five pounds I needed to get my five pound free bet. And it was easy. I'd been passed over for promotion at work, and that made me frustrated. To be honest, I was on a bit of a plateau. There was no more excitement at work. And that commute down to London was really taking it out of me. And now I was trying to come to terms with the fact that my son had a severe disability. And maybe gambling at first was a bit of an escape because I won that bet. And I've asked myself so many times, what would have happened if I'd lost? I think I would have closed my laptop down and thought, what a waste of time that is. But I won. And I see that time and time again with people who place their first bet and win and suddenly think it's easy. 
I began to engage in sport a bit more, to watch more sport, to read a bit more about it. I began to gamble a bit more. At first, it felt like a bit of excitement. Do you know what? I didn't tell Emma. I never, ever told her. That's significant. Because I must have thought in my mind, actually, what I'm doing is wrong. I looked after the finances. We had separate bank accounts, so she didn't see what I was doing. I began to withdraw as a husband. She'd say to me, Justin, we've been invited out for supper this weekend um, with friends. Should we go? And I'd always have said, yeah, I'd love to. But I'd say things like, you go, have fun, I'll look after Matthew for you. What I was really saying was, you go and get out of the house so I can gamble without you seeing me. I said to my boss, it's not productive me driving to the station and catching a train and coming back. And, you know, I, what about if you set me up from home? I'd be much more productive. So we did. He set up my systems for me. And I used to do my work in two hours. And then the rest of the day would stretch out ahead of me. And to fill that time, I did the wrong thing. I looked for excitement in gambling and began to gamble on all sorts of things. I began to gamble more. I began to gamble bigger stakes to get the same kind of thrill. And then one day I worked out I wasn't winning as much as I was losing. That made me cross. I'm a competitive person. I'm a terrible loser. I'm also an optimist. I'm expecting the best outcome. And in the army and the rugby field, if you hit a problem, you work out a way around it. The trouble is with gambling, you need to know when to stop. And I just didn't. I calculated how much money I'd lost, and I thought, that's it. Uh, I don't want to do gambling anymore. Uh, it was about £700 I'd lost over three or four months. I thought, I'll just win all that money back in one go, and then close my, uh, my account down, and I won't do it anymore. I needed £1,000 to place on a tennis match that was coming up. I thought I knew the outcome of. £1,000. I'd never placed anything like that much money before. I thought, if Emma saw this, she'd be so angry. But it's okay, because this is the last time I can win that money back. I just couldn't let it go. I lost that bet. The first thing I did, as I phoned up my bank, I arranged an overdraft and put another £1,000 on the next, next tennis match. I was chasing my losses. I was doing something that was really very stupid. Now... There was a bit of a hole in our finances. But I didn't stop pretending to live the life that we lived. I didn't cut down on things. I carried on having the holidays that we used to have and, and the lifestyle that we used to enjoy because I didn't want anyone to see. I didn't want anyone to know that this person who, who was a successful business person and a good husband would have done something stupid. So I covered everything up. And to cover things up, I began to borrow money. One day, uh, someone walked by the house and, and knocked on our door, and they said, I've seen your house so many times, we really like it, we'd like to buy it. And they gave us a really good offer. And, and Emma said to me, we were discussing it, she said, you know, I've seen you're not happy at the moment. It's because we live in a town, isn't it? I know how much you love the countryside, so come on, let's sell the house, and we'll go and move somewhere in the country, and I'll get you back. Six weeks later, uh, I was in the rented house that we'd moved out to. I was upstairs in the office and I looked out the window. It was a lovely spring day. I could see Emma walking up the lane. She had a spring in her step. She was really happy about something. She got to the window and she called up. She said, Justin, I've found it. I've found the perfect house. Come on, come with me. So I went with her and we, we went to the end of the lane where there was an old Victorian kitchen garden, big tall brick wall. I often wondered what was behind it. We walked through a little door and stepped into paradise. A beautiful garden with views for miles and a lovely little cottage. And the lady that lived there sadly had just lost her husband. She wanted to move quickly to be near her daughter. She hadn't even put it on the market. The price she was asking was really reasonable. And then I looked around for a way out. And there in the corner of the garden was a little pond. It was no more than a puddle. But I said, look Emma, we can't live here. Matthew might fall in and drown. And that beautiful smile on her face, her hopes and her dreams of, of getting me back and having a safe family environment. By now, little Oscar had been born as well. You see, the problem was, 
I had squandered all the equity from the sale of our house. And I was by now so heavily in debt, there's no way we would have been able to get a mortgage. And I carried on living the lie. Well, Emma would spend her days looking um, at, at estate agents and finding particulars. And we went to visit house after house. And every time we'd go in and we'd look around, she'd say, this is perfect, isn't it? And I'd say, oh, but it's too near the main road. Or the garden's too big. Or the garden's too small. Excuse after excuse. And those little lies turned into big lies. And you know, when you lie, life is stressful. Because you have to remember what you've lied about. And to overcome that stress that I was feeling, the stupidity, the self-loathing that I felt, I used to go onto my computer, log in and think, this is okay. I'm going to win now. Then I can pay everything back and, and everything will be all right. That was the insanity of it. And unfortunately, it was my own pride that made me think that way. Rather than putting my hand up and saying, I need to get some help here before, before this gets out of control. I said, I'm the one that's got myself into this mess. I'm the one that needs to get myself out of it. Unfortunately, my logic was to carry on gambling. And because I was only accountable to myself, the lies that I told myself, or eventually that addiction voice in my head told me, I believed. I don't want to go into too much more detail, but over the course of two and a half years, I went from someone who placed his first bet to someone who had absolutely no control of, of life. I pretended for so long. One of the things I did, and Matthew, bless him, by now had got a diagnosis for, for autism, as well as right side hemiplegia, uh, as well as epilepsy. And that meant he, when he sets his mind on something, that's what he wants to do. And one day he just wanted some time with me. He said, Dad, please take me to the swings. We were down at my in-law's house. It was raining outside. We'd finished lunch, and Matthew said again, Dad, please, take me to the swings. And Emma said to me, oh, go on, take him. But can you go home first and pick his coat up? So we got in the car. I drove a couple of miles back to our house. Uh, Matthew was in the front of the car, strapped in with the engine running. I walked into the house. I put my hand on his coat, and I remembered. That morning, I placed a bet. I thought, I'll just go upstairs and, and check my account, and make sure that the money's been credited. But it hadn't been. I'd lost. And that made me angry. So in my head, I justified this behavior. I said, I'll just go to the online casino, play a quick game of roulette, win that money back, and then I can go and spend some time with my son. Two and a half hours later, I'd emptied out my bank account again. I went downstairs, and Matthew had fallen asleep in the car. And the tears that he'd cried himself to sleep with were dried on his cheeks. What kind of a dad does that? Only by now one who is lost to an illness. Now that's not an excuse. I entirely accept responsibility for what I did. But I was in the grip of something quite horrible. One day Emma went and opened the fridge and there was no food. She said, we need to go and get some food for the children. But it was five days to payday and I had no money. But we went to Sainsbury's. I got out my wallet, and the only thing I could use to pay for it was my corporate card, a card that I could only use for work expenses. But I paid for the groceries, and I said, it's not stealing. If they ask me, I'll just say I got my cards mixed up, and I'll pay the money back at the end of the month. But it was just a couple of days later that I realized that my corporate card worked on my gambling account. When I pressed the button to transfer money from my company into my gambling account, I knew that was my career over. All those years I'd spent working my way up, the safety that it guaranteed, the security for my family was gone. I didn't sleep very much over the next few nights. In fact, it took um, two months before the phone call came, and then it went something like this. Justin, something terrible's happened. Your corporate card's been cloned. There's fraudulent activity all over it, gambling transactions. Really sorry, we're going to have to close your account and, and get you a new card. Is that okay? I said, boss, they're not fraudulent in my own transactions. I went in to see the head of HR just two days later. She'd laid out all my corporate card statements on a table. She asked me to underline the ones that were my own. 27,500 pounds worth of my company's money. 
Needless to say, I couldn't work there anymore. I was a shareholder, a director. Um, I was um, an authorized person within that organization. I had some very senior client relationships. There's no way I could work there. Actually, they could have called the police. But because I was a shareholder, there was a way out. Now, that's the point where I should have gone home and said to Emma, I'm really sorry, I need to talk to you about a problem that I've got. But as I drove home, I was placing bets on Wimbledon. And when I got back, I said, Emma, I've left there, and I've got another job, much better one to go to. I'm just going to be at home for a while. Now, with no income, I began to be creative about the ways that I could fund my habit. I began to sell those things that we had in our house. Lovely things. I sold a watch that Emma had given me for a wedding anniversary, and she asked me where it was. I said, oh, it's just in for a service. In a moment of madness, I sold the wedding band that she'd given me with a beautiful verse inscribed on the inside of it that only we knew. We had some friends to stay, and they found a bank statement in the spare room. They showed it to Emma, and they said, do you know what your husband's doing? I remember that look on her face. She came towards me, uh, almost really defensively, begging me, tell me this is a mistake. Tell me that we've got this wrong. But I told her everything, and bless her, she stood by me at first. But then I had an email from another company to say, have a 50 pound free bet. And I said to myself, a free bet? That's okay. That's not really gambling. You see, I'd self-excluded myself from that one online site, but there's two and a half thousand online gambling sites that we could log into this morning. At the time, I would have had to self-excluded. I had a wonderful opportunity a couple of years ago to walk into the House of Lords just before an amendment to the gambling uh, laws uh, about a one-stop self-exclusion. I shared my story, and so did others. And at the end of that time, they debated the amendment. It didn't even go to a vote. And it's now law that there is a one-stop self-exclusion. You can press a button and self-exclude yourself from all the gambling sites. I think possibly that would have saved my marriage at the time. Because now I was back into my old ways, and this time Emma could see. And one morning I woke up, and the house was quiet. There was no sound of children's TV. There was no noise of my children having their breakfast. Emma had taken them with her and left. She was right to go. Because I was self-destructing. I was living off a sack of moldy potatoes. I uh, couldn't afford to rent, heat the house, and I had five months rent owing. They were very dark times, and, and I'm sad to say that I took the most precious thing that I owned, my sword of honor, and I sold it for 200 pounds. I cried when I left that shop because that bit of metal represented everything that had been good. And now, here I was, reduced to someone with 200 pounds in my pocket. The next morning, I came to my senses, and I phoned the shop, and I said, I've made a terrible mistake. I need to get my sword back. Is it okay? Please. And he said, we've just sold it. We've got no record of where it's gone. I'm not sure what would happen to me over the next few weeks. I think maybe one of two things. I perhaps would have thought what life would have been like for my children if I wasn't around at all anymore. I maybe would have committed a crime and gone to prison. This afternoon after the service, I'm going off to see a friend who is in prison now because of his gambling addiction. But not for me. For me, there was a knock at the door. My mum came up with my brother. Um, They said, Justin, you're about to be evicted. Your father-in-law has paid off the rent arrears. You can walk the streets or you can come back to Kent. Try and find some recovery. I walked around the house for about an hour, putting my last bits and pieces of possessions in my black bin liner. I had some pictures and some clothes and one bin liner of stuff and 73,000 pounds worth of debt. I was broken. Finally, that pride snapped when I was completely humiliated in front of my mum, who'd been there that day to see me being presented with a sword of honour. And that's what I needed. Because it was then without my pride that Christ could begin to work on my life. 
Some of us need to be gently pruned. Um, I don't know how many of you watched Gardeners World, but I, I saw on Friday they were talking about clematis. There's early flowering clematis and late flowering clematis. The early flowering clematis <laughs> needs really just a tiny bit of pruning and the flowers will come up. That late flowering clematis needs to be hard cut right down and all the flowers and all the beauty comes on the new growth. For me, I had to be cut back. Oh, it hurts. I got down on my knees. Finally, that night, uh, in the spare room um, that I'd left when I was 18 years of age, and I prayed a prayer. Really simple prayer. A bit like that prayer when I'd seen that picture for the first time. Jesus, the light of the world. I prayed, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Come back into my life and mend me if you can. And he did. It's the very last time I ever placed a bet. It's well over four years ago now. Now, it wasn't all easy. Um, he had to fix me on the outside, all, all those things in my mind, my triggers, all those things that reminded me of gambling, the, the chemical addiction that gambling has in your, your brain, but also the physical addiction when you do something over and over again. It's a complex addiction. He fixed me on the outside pretty much straight away. It took a little bit longer to fix me on the inside. I firmly believe that for every addict, there is pain that we're carrying uh, and that our our misuse of whatever it might be, whether that's food or alcohol or pornography or drugs or, or anything at all, it, it's the use of that harmful thing that we have that covers up that pain that we've all got. Most people get through life fine. They deal with that pain. And as Christians, we have a wonderful way of dealing with pain on the inside. And that's why I love Christ-based recovery. Because he fixes us on the inside as well as the outside. And if you'd said to me, Justin, what was your pain? Why, why did you go from someone who had everything to throw it all away like that? I'd have said, oh, I didn't have any pain. I had a lovely upbringing. Don't start talking about my upbringing and my youth. And, and then I started to write my book because I wanted people to know that there's a downside to gambling. When you look at all these adverts, it all looks so happy, doesn't it? Actually, the reality is it's horrible. It is a very isolating thing and a very selfish thing. So I wanted people to know that there was a downside. And as I started to write, I began to cry. And I phoned up my editor and I said, I'm doing this all wrong. I'm not, I'm not very good at writing. I'm not meant to be an author. Because I keep crying. She said, oh, you need to do that. You need to take your readers back to that place of pain. So they can see that with you. Not just look at it reflecting from afar. And I saw those points in my life when I had pain. And one of those points was when I was 13 years old. My dad came into my bedroom one evening and he was crying. My dad never cries, so I knew something was up. He said, Justin, I'll just say goodbye to mum. The doctors have told me she's not going to last the night. She's on some medication that she may respond to, but they've told me to expect the worst, and I'm telling you now. I didn't sleep much that night, and the next morning when I woke up, I was different. There was something inside me, a defense mechanism, that as a 13-year-old had gone from someone who completely trusted adults, particularly the ones we loved. My mum was my best friend. She'd turn a walk into the woods to pirate adventure and big picnics, and she was always there for me. And now, when I woke up, I realized she's just abandoned me. It wasn't her fault. And actually, as you guys probably know, she didn't die, and seven years later was quite miraculously healed. But it was too late for me. My defense mechanism was someone who had to excel at everything they did. And the more people that saw how well I did things, the more they'd love me and, and maybe the less chance there was of them abandoning me. And then I coupled with that all the pain of the stuff that I'd seen in the army, which I hadn't dealt with. Maybe there was a reason why I went into that self-destruct mode. I have so much fun now reaching out and helping other people who've got all kinds of addictions. Addictions to social media. Addictions to, to anything. The way of getting through life and modern life is so difficult to get through without us forming habits. And companies want us to form habits because we'll buy more stuff from them. And when we buy stuff, we feel better about ourselves. We don't deal with the emotions in the way we should. Um, I, uh, one of the things that I did, by the way, the boys came back. I want you to know... Um, when I stopped, Emma could see that I had completely left that all behind me. Uh, and for a while, we were a family again. Now, it's a bit tricky because they're up in Derbyshire. 
and I'm down here during the week, but I have a place in Derbyshire now. I spend so much time with them. It's time with them that's important. And the restoration that Christ has done is wonderful. It's a work in progress. The fact that I didn't tell Emma really damaged trust. Trust is so precious. Be really careful with it in your, in your family lives. The sword of honor came back too. On a Christmas Eve, um, someone found it. It had been away for three years. If you Google Justin Larkham, you come up with all sorts of stuff. Um, and, and that's what this person did. He'd been looking for something online and saw a sword of honor. And he was an ex-army officer, and he thought, no one sells a sword of honor. It must be stolen. There's a story here. So he Googled my name, got in contact with one of the newspapers that had run my story, and it came back on Christmas Eve, which was lovely. Um, I have, um, as I say, the pleasure of getting involved in a recovery course. Um, Holy Trinity, Brompton, HTB have uh, a recovery course um, which um, now has moved away from HTB, but it's based on Alpha format. We run that in Tunbridge, um, but I also have a charity that I, I helped to found, um, which is responsible for making sure that churches have access to that recovery course if they want it. It's a 15-session Christ-based recovery, making no secret of the fact that it's Christ that sets us free on the inside as well as the outside. Uh, and we've got courses starting up and down the country all over the place, which is really, really wonderful. And to see people that came through on my first recovery course who were suicidal, now in, as small group leaders, helping other people on their journey. It's wonderful. It really is. I've got some uh, invitation cards, the next course that we s is starting in September. I want you to think, don't think addiction as in someone who, who's really needy and homeless and has a drug or alcohol addiction. Think of someone who has a secret habit, which is difficult for them to talk about, that they need to be set free from. Perhaps people who desperately want to live in the light, but are struggling because they have a habit. Those are the kinds of people that respond best to that recovery course. I want to um, finish with a story, um, because I think it puts things nicely in, in context. My self-esteem was really, really low when I came out of, of my addiction. Um, and so I began to swim. And exercise is a great way of trying to restore a bit of normality in, in your life. Um, but you might think I replaced one addiction with another when I tell you that rather than swim a few lengths, I decided to sign up for a cross-channel solo swim. <laughs> and on the 7th of September 2014, I set off across um, the channel. I also want to share with you the fact that I paid off my last penny of debt because a wonderful charity called WKDA, West Kent Dead Advice, I think they've got branches over here in Seven Oaks as, as well, um, but it's based in my church, Tunbridge Baptist Church, um, helped me out. They dealt with that, that debt and I got it paid off. When I paid off my last penny of debt, I volunteered as a, as a debt advisor. I now help them once a month. I see people who've got themselves into a terrible mess. And do you know, it's the debt... That causes the relationships to break down. It's the debt that causes people to take their own lives. Uh, and debt's something that if you face up to, can be dealt with very quickly. If you hide from it, it gets worse. But debt-free, life was much, much better. Um, and I'm working again. I, I two very, two jobs. One's very, very boring. Uh, I write textbooks in insurance now. Uh, and it's mind-numbingly boring. But... <laughs> I also have quite an exciting job um, because I get to go around to all the premiership rugby clubs, every county cricket club, um, and some football clubs as well. Those of you like Chelsea, I, I was there the other day helping them out in the academy. I warn people of the dangers. We do education and awareness, which is prevention training. I do it in schools, do it in prisons, do it in the financial sector, and do it in the army as well, going up to Yorkshire to see a regiment on Tuesday. And I love that the most. And that for me is exciting. Those are the sectors that we think have the highest risk. And by the way, if you're 16 to 23, you are three times more likely to have a problem with gambling than any other age group. And that's because of this, the smartphones. And those that age group are the most adept at smartphone technology. They're also the ones that the advertising are aimed at. Okay, so did I make it? You, do you want to know? Okay. Um, as you can see, it's nice and flat. That is a cross-channel ferry, and it will be the means of transport that I cross to France from now on. I went through the two busiest shipping lanes, um, and just before I got into the water to set off, I said to my pilot, someone who'd been across um, the water and back for 27 years, he knew those waters really, really well. I said, what should I do? One thing, one bit of advice you can help me with. He said, all you have to do, stay close to the boat, I'll get you across. That's all he said. 
And I did for 10 hours. I stayed right up next to the boat. I trusted him completely. And I saw the big tanker ships coming and going. And, and they fed me every hour. And things were fine. And then something catastrophic happened. I saw France. And I suddenly thought, great, I made it. Oh, I don't need you anymore, Mr. Pilot. And anyway, why are you going off in that direction? When I can see France is just there, I'll just go in a straight line. What my pilot was doing was setting the boat off against a 2.7 knot tide which had started off the coast of France and it got dark. And I drifted further and further away from the boat thinking I was going in a straight line. Actually, I'll show you that what I thought was a straight line looks like. <laughs> don't. I did twice the distance to most people. I did it on the day of the highest tidal reach of the year on, in the swimming season. Actually, um, there was one other person that did it that, the same day, and she got an award. Uh, I didn't, obviously, but she did, which was great. <laughs> what my pilot was trying to do was get me, um, can you see that, was get me down the back of Cap Grenade, because when the tide was about to change, that's where he wanted me to be. But what happened, because I started to do that, meant I was kind of doing that. Yeah. And I missed Cap Grenet. And I was in this place they call the washing machine. I had a 15 knot wind now in the opposite direction to that tide, which meant one thing, waves. And as I turned my head to breathe, I was getting lots of salt water. My throat was closing up. My tongue was expanding. I was finding it really difficult to breathe. I was cold. My shoulders were aching. I was being tossed around in, in, by the waves. I was in real trouble. But would I go closer to my boat? <laughs> they were calling me. They were saying, Justin, come back. And then suddenly they shone a great big light down on the back of the, in the bit of water where I'd been swimming that day. And suddenly I thought, ah, they want me to be in that light, don't they? Yeah. So I swam back. And when I got there, I got shelter from the lee of the wind. And the waves were still there, but this time in the light, I could see them. So I just ducked my head and stopped myself from taking on salt water. I got a triple strength carb fee. That was great. And they encouraged me. They got me to where I wanted to be. That's just like my life. When I go off on my own thinking I know best, living in the darkness, I struggle. But when I live in the light... When I read this every day, when I talk to my creator, I realize he has a plan for me. He has a plan for us. They're plans to prosper, not to harm us. And sometimes we can miss them, just like I miss that little bit of France. We need to be very protective of our, our spiritual health, don't we, of that relationship. We need to read our Bible. We need to live in the light. We need the church community and our friends around us to keep us on that straight path. And if there is a cloud in your life that's blocking your relationship with Christ, with your family, with yourself, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Talk to someone about it, maybe. Don't feel shame. Because this is the message that I have. And I want to read you something really quickly. I'm going to read it so quick. Um, does, anyone read, um, does anyone read the Bible in a year? A few of you. I won't ask you if you read it this morning. But this morning there was, it was a lovely story. I'm going to read to you really, really quickly. And this is where we're going to finish. A water bearer in India had two large pots, both hung on the ends of a pole, which he carried across his neck. One of the pots had a crack in it, while the other pot was perfect and always delivered a full portion of water. At the end of the long walk from the stream to the house, the cracked pot always arrived half full. The poor cracked pot was ashamed of its own imperfection and miserable that it was able to accomplish only half of what it had been, able, been made to do. After two years of what it perceived to be a bitter failure, it spoke to the water bearer one day by the stream. I'm ashamed of myself and I want to apologize to you. I've been able to deliver only half my load because my, this crack in my side causes water to leak out all the way back to your house. Because of my flaws, you have to do all of this work and you don't get full value for your efforts. The bearer said to the pot, Did you notice that there were flowers only on your side of the path, but not on the other pot's side? That's because I've always known about your flaw. And I planted flower seeds on your side of the path. And every day while we walk back, you've watered them. For two years, I've been able to pick these beautiful flowers to decorate the table. Without you being just the way you are, 
there would not be this beauty to grace the house. God loves us as we are. It's the way he made us. Who are we to feel ashamed? And maybe you feel that it's a flaw in your character that's stopping you from being used by Christ. Well, don't. That verse I read from Corinthians is all about how he loves to use our weaknesses. And that's why on Tuesday, I'm going to stand in front of 50 officers and talk to them about the dangers of gambling in a situation where Christ might be able to use me. And he's got a story for each and every one of us. And the fundamental thing is, and I've said it already this morning, he loves you. Let's close in prayer. Father God, forgive us for not giving you room in our lives. And for the times when we think we know it all. And for the times when we think that we're just too broken or too damaged for you to use us. Thank you that it's in our weakness, in our imperfections, that you can use us. Help us this week to live in the light, to turn our backs on our secret habits, and to turn towards your perfect light and your perfect love. In your name, amen.